This morning we want to continue our series on embracing the essentials of true Christianity. As we conclude today this section of this series titled Understanding God's Plan of the Ages from Beginning to End. So let me invite you to take your Bibles and open them with me to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Let me remind you that we have understood from the outset of this study that the purpose of God and his plan of the ages is to glorify his sovereignty and his grace. In creation and in redemption, ultimately expressed in the establishment of his kingdom and the heavens and the earth through Jesus Christ, which we'll observe in Revelation chapters 20 through 22 today. And as we think of God's plan, all of his plan unravels and can be defined in the seven dispensations of the ages, in which we learn positively that without faith, it is impossible to please God, and that faith in the Lord is never misplaced faith and brings glory to God. But we've also been learning negatively that apart from the grace of God, man is a spiritual flop and a failure in self-rule, and in self-dependence. And we know that that was true in the first dispensation, in which man miserably failed, they took of the forbidden fruit, they spiritually died, the curses were placed in the garden, and yet in the midst of that, those curses was the promise of Genesis 3.15, a promise of a coming savior, a coming redeemer, who would not only provide eternal salvation by God's grace for mankind through his crushing work, but who would, as a result, save the earth from the curse and recapture the planet from Satan for God. And it is imperative that you remember that promise, for the rest of the book is viewed in light of this. As we come to the New Testament, we understand and we need to remember that Jesus Christ would come to save sinners. And number two, he would come to set up God's kingdom on earth as promised throughout the Old Testament. With the nation of Israel at the center of the plan. And that is why the book of Matthew is all about Jesus, king of the Jews, Because as I mentioned last week, a Jew would want to know, number one, was Jesus Christ truly the Messiah? Number two, did he really offer the kingdom? Number three, if so, why was he rejected? And number four, if he was rejected, would he still fulfill those promises? And the book of Matthew will say, yes, 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 and yes. We started out with the prologue of the king in which we saw the birth line of Jesus Christ. We saw his virgin conception and birth. We saw the worship of the wise men and only God is to be worshipped. Thus Jesus Christ is God. And we saw the protection by God as Satan sought to destroy the man-child as soon as he was born. We move from there to the preparation of the king. And in doing so we saw the ministry of John the Baptist baptizing repentant Israelites in view of the coming kingdom and telling them to believe on him who was to come. And yet, we know that he even baptized the Lord Jesus Christ at the age of 30, which began his public ministry and identified with his repentant remnant and the nation of Israel. Furthermore, we saw the temptation of Jesus Christ where the first Adam failed, the last Adam succeeded. And as a result, we saw that he began to preach publicly in synagogues like in his hometown of Nazareth, by which when he was done, they sought to kill him as he preached the message of grace and exposed their self-righteousness. But we also saw that the message of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ initially was repent, change your mind, for the kingdom of heaven the kingdom which comes from heaven, 
That long-awaited kingdom is at hand. That offer was on the table. The Lord Jesus in Matthew 4, 17 said the very same words, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 4, 23, he went around preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then on the Sermon of the Mount, he said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In fact, those beatitudes are all tied into Old Testament promises about the messianic kingdom. For you see, God had made his promises first in the Abrahamic kingdom, a covenant, excuse me, to Abraham and his physical descendants of a seed and a blessing and a land, then confirmed in the land covenant and expanded the Davidic covenant and in the new covenant, unlike the Mosaic covenant, which was a conditional covenant. Those three or four were unconditional. We know that Jesus Christ came and offered that kingdom, and we must keep that in mind when we're reading the gospel narratives. But he was rejected through his death and resurrection. He now is building his church, but those promises one day will be fulfilled in the kingdom to come. And so when we're reading Matthew, we're reading Mark, we're reading Luke, and even the beginning of John and such, keep in mind that it's the messianic kingdom that has been promised, that is being heralded. heralded. Like Jeremiah 31, 34, when one day all people will know the Lord. Like Isaiah 11, when one day the wolf will lie with the lamb and the lion and so forth. Like Genesis 15, when the land promises will one day be fulfilled. Or like 2 Samuel 7, in which the Messiah one day will sit on the throne of David and rule from Jerusalem. And that is why here on the Sermon on the Mount, when asked, how should we pray? Our Lord told his disciples, pray, your kingdom come. Your will be done, Father, on earth. On earth as it is in, in heaven. In fact, in Matthew 9, 35, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogue, preaching what? That he would suffer and die and be raised from the dead? No. The gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But keep in mind, what was necessary to enter that kingdom, he made very clear to Nicodemus, you must be born again. How? By faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was preaching these truths to people like Nicodemus and the woman at the well as John chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 precede chronologically the Sermon on the Mount in Matthews 5, 6, and 7. For there in the Sermon on the Mount where you should be turned to Matthew 5, Look at verse 20 with me. Jesus Christ says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. By no means literally means never. Who may enter the kingdom of heaven? And remember, Jesus had explained to Nicodemus earlier to enter the kingdom of heaven, you needed to be born again. It was through this new birth you would receive a righteousness that was not imparted but was imputed, was put to your account by God himself in justification. And I say that because many Bible commentators in Matthew 5.20 says this is a practical righteousness of how you live. Oh no. For all our righteousness are like filthy rags, Isaiah 64, verse 6. And that's why Isaiah 61, 10 says that we need to be covered with the robes of God's righteousness. Or as Paul would say it in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he, God, made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As I think of that imputed righteousness and entering that kingdom, we go to Matthew chapter 7 and look at verse 13 and 14. And what does he say? Enter you in at the straight gate. 
For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Notice again the contrast that we see in these verses. Again, we have on the one hand the many, on the other hand we have the few. On the one hand, we have the straight gate. On the other hand, we have wide as the gate. We have a broad way and we have a narrow way. You see, the difference between the two is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And many are on the broad road that lead to destruction and ultimately to hell. And one must enter, by faith, the narrow gate. You see, the majority, dear friends, is always wrong, according to Jesus Christ. There's few that find it. And it's narrow because there's only one way, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And all the religions of the world teach salvation by works. Only true Christianity teaches salvation by grace. And it's always been by grace. In every dispensation, as is true today. And it's only been by faith. In the Lord. And that's why I look at Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter, enter the kingdom of heaven. Now notice the word enter again. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, notice the word many again. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, did many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Notice there are many, but they are rejected. What a fearful thing to stand before the Lord one day. And by the way, in the context, the many are referred to earlier, many false teachers, many religious people. Notice what is their claim to fame. Lord, look at what I have done. And I've done it in your name. And he says, I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. You know why? Because you didn't rely on me alone. You relied on Lord, Lord, haven't we done this? This is salvation by human achievement, not by divine accomplishment. These are the lordshippers of Jesus' day as it were, who claim his lordship, but are still relying on their works to get them into heaven. And I wonder how many more people like that are today doing the same thing. You say, well, what does it mean here to do the will of my father? It's interesting because later in Matthew 21, 31 and 32, he says this, which of the two did the will of his father? Then they said to him, well, the first dead, the first son, who changed his mind. Jesus said to them, surely I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you Pharisees. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and the problem was you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. You see... Obviously, we're not talking about practical righteousness here. Otherwise, tax collectors and harlots would not enter first. We're talking about imputed righteousness through faith in the Lord as presented in the word of God. That's what was necessary to enter the kingdom of God. And that's why Israel miserably failed. Because they sought righteousness, according to the end of Romans 9, not by faith, but by the works of the law. But it wasn't without full knowledge of our Lord. For we move from the preaching of the king to the power of the king in Matthew chapters 8 and 9. And these were the proofs of his Messiahship. If Jesus Christ was the Messiah, he could bring in the kingdom. Did he have the power to really do it? And in this section, Matthew clusters a bunch of miracles of our Lord that show his power, his power over demonic forces as he cast demons out of people, his power over disease as he healed one person after another, 
His power over nature as he allowed them to catch such an abundance of fish they didn't know what to do with it. Including making willing believers fishers of men. And he even had the power to forgive sins. Thus indisputable proof that Jesus has the power of the Christ or the Messiah. Which leads us now to the program of the king. Go with me to chapter 10 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10. And now we read his selection of and sending out of his 12 disciples or apostles. And we pick it up in verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of who? Of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is, now please note it again, at hand. Notice the kingdom which comes from heaven that is going to be placed on the earth is available. It is at hand. It is near. You can get in on it. That was the message not only John the Baptist preached. That was the message not only Jesus Christ preached. But that was the initial message the twelve preached as well. We read in Matthew chapter 11 verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Now let me pause for a minute. Why is he asking? Because John's waiting for the kingdom to get set up. And it isn't happening yet. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. In other words, I am fulfilling Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And may the same be true of us. May we not stumble. May we not be offended, as it were, because of Jesus Christ. May we be willing to stand for him. May we be willing to proclaim the gospel message around him. And so we see the Lord Jesus Christ here affirming again who he is. He is the Messiah. So go with me now to chapter 11 and verse 20. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. And we begin to see in chapters 11 and 12. Really, this should be 12 and this should really be 13. This progressive rejection of the king. That he's doing miracles, but people aren't repenting. And again, repent means to change their mind. They're not embracing him by faith. They haven't changed their minds. And they're still trying to seek righteousness by their works. Now, what is the turning point of Jesus' ministry? It's right here in chapter 12 where Israel's unsaved national and religious leaders reject Jesus as the Messiah. And all of this is called the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So we look at chapter 12. I should say 12 here. Let's make this correction. Verse 22. Then one was brought to him, Jesus, who was demon-possessed, blind and mute. And he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Notice Christ's miracles and his healings were instantaneous and complete. It wasn't two weeks later, I'm feeling a little better. And again, this was proof not only that he is God, but he, had, he was the Messiah. And what, was they, what were they starting to conclude? Verse 23. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? The term for the Messiah. 2 Samuel 7, Messianic line. Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, 
This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. In other words, they couldn't deny the reality of the miracle, so they denied the source of the miracle, the power of the miracle, that it didn't come from God, the Holy Spirit. It came from Satan himself, Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. That's a truism. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Well, that's a truism. And if, for the sake of argument, Satan casts out Satan as you're claiming that he is divided against himself, how then will his kingdom stand? Well, it won't. In other words, this doesn't make sense. And if, first class condition, let's assume for the sake of argument, I cast out demons by Beelzebub, which he didn't, but let's assume that for a moment. By whom do your sons, your disciples, cast them out? Obviously, they were claiming it was through the power of God, which means it was biased. Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if, here's the third possibility, for the sake of argument, I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then here's the conclusion. Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you, just like I've been preaching. Or else how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me. He who does not scatter, gather with me, scatters abroad. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, this is the unpardonable, this is the unforgivable sin, called also the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. But what is it? You say, I don't know, but don't do it, right? Don't do it. Well, what is it? It was claiming that the miracles that Jesus performed were done through the power of Satan, thus blasphemy or showing great contempt and insult for the Holy Spirit's power. Secondly, who did it? Unsaved, unbelieving religious leaders who had seen the miracles of Jesus Christ. What were its ramifications? There would be no forgiveness of this sin, as the nation would be judged for rejecting their Messiah, and the kingdom of heaven is no longer said to be at hand. And that is very significant. From this point on, you will not read again until Luke 23, in which the, the kingdom would be at hand, and then it will be in the tribulation to come, it will be preached again to be at hand. Why couldn't it be forgiven? Because they were unwilling to put their trust in Jesus as the Christ and be forgiven and had officially rejected their Messiah. You see, dear friends, this, was, this unpardonable sin was unique to that generation. It was a national sin, not really a personal sin, though it did involve people. It can't be done today. It was done by unbelieving Jewish leaders. And that's why never again in the Bible do you read in the book of Acts or anywhere else someone committing the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And the essence of the sin was unbelief, which is still true today, in the sense that he did, that does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And at this point, at this point, you will see a shift that occurs, a pedagogical shift, a shift in its teaching. For the first time, you're going to hear now, the kingdom will be delayed. And that's in chapter 13. But now go to chapter 16. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said to Peter, 
Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven, verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, a little rock, and on this rock, this huge rock, I will build my ecclesia, my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. For the first time uttered by the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ is this prediction, I, as he is the builder of the church, will build in the future my church, my ecclesia. And that phrase, will build, is a future active indicative. It is an absolute promise of something he would do in the future, guaranteed. And the word church is in reference again to the universal church. And this is new revelation. Furthermore, we look at chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. From that time, he began to teach. No longer is he preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now he's preaching, I'm going to suffer and die and be raised from the dead. Now that does not mean he didn't believe there would be a future kingdom. For in chapter 16, verse 28, we read, As surely I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Which means it was still going to come. By the way, that was fulfilled in chapter 17 on the Mount of Transfiguration in which these, some of these disciples had the opportunity to see a preview, as it were, of the second coming of Jesus Christ. So we see now a new message. I will build my church. I'm going to suffer and die and be raised from the dead. A new direction things are going. But this is not plan B, as some suggest. This is all part of the plan of God. Again, wrapped up in Genesis 3.15 as far as a promised Savior for the world and a kingdom on earth. But it is new revelation as far as something Christ had in his heart, as it were, and did not reveal in the Old Testament. I will build my. Now go to Matthew 23. And once again we see that the kingdom is not canceled, just postponed. For in Matthew 23 are the seven woes in which Christ gives great denunciation and condemnation of the Jewish religious leaders of his day. And for our purposes we pick it up in verse 34. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and scourge and crucify. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Watch this, verse 36. As surely I say to you all, all these things will come upon this generation. Again, the blast against the Holy Spirit. Coming judgment on this generation. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Notice, God's intent was to gather, but they were not willing. Sounds to me like resistible grace. And I say that because there are some who teach that God gives irresistible grace. You can't stop it. When he wants something, it'll happen. Well, we see clearly he wanted to do this, but they were not willing and it did not happen. See, your house is left to you desolate, is their temple. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they will say that 
at the end of the tribulation period as they call upon Jesus Christ to save them. And as we saw in our scripture reading this morning, Romans 11, all Israel one day will be saved as promised by the Old Testament. And that is why on the heels of Matthew 23 come Matthew 24 and 25. What is called the Olivet Discourse, as this was Christ preaching on the Mount of Olives. And in essence, it's his farewell speech to Israel. And he's saying, you've rejected me, but I'm coming again. I will fulfill the promise. And that's why I look at Matthew 24, verse 14. And what will be true in the tribulation period to come? And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come, the end of the age. In other words, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached again. Why? Because the kingdom will be near again, right before the Lord returns to the Mount of Olives. And indeed, as you read the passage, you will see he's going to return, he's going to come again, He's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to judge the sheep and the goats. And, and on and on it goes. Now this is in contrast to the upper room discourse, which happens a little later in that Passion Week. On the night in which Christ is betrayed, in which he now meets with his disciples and he says, Listen, I told you I will build my church. I'm going to suffer and die and be raised from the dead. I'm going to go to my father's house and prepare a place for you. And I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And he's going to not only dwell with you forever, he's going to be in you permanently. And I am going to accomplish many things in this age to come. And so he's preparing them for the coming church, which will happen in just a few days. We know also as we study... The New Testament that Jesus Christ then was betrayed that night by Judas. He was illegally arrested that night. Just like he promised. He would suffer and die and be raised from the dead. And God always keeps his promises. He's illegally tried that night by the Jewish authorities. He's later tried by Pontius Pilate and found innocent. And yet he scourged, though he was found innocent. And eventually he is crucified on Golgotha, also called Calvary, where he was crucified with a thief on one side and a thief on the other side and experienced an absolutely horrible death. And between the hours of 12 and 3, when darkness covered the face of the earth, he cries out, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? As he was experiencing spiritual death, as our sins were poured out upon him, for the penalty for sin is death, and death always carries the idea of separation and abandonment, as it were. And thus on that cross, all of our sins were paid, past, present, and future, bar none. And he cried out, it is finished. And we know that that Greek word tetelestai was also used of that which would be stamped on documents to show that they were paid in full. And thus the Lord Jesus Christ paid in full your sin and mine as he died on that cross as the one mediator between God and man who would give his life a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He predicted this, as did the scriptures. And when God says something, he never lies. But death and grave could not hold or conquer the Savior. For on the third day, he rose again, just as he predicted. So we go now to Matthew chapter 28. In verse 1. Now after the Sabbath is the first day of the week, began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him, and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, 
Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. Indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And what an amazing day that was. How three days later, Jesus Christ rose victorious from the dead, just as he said. And as a result, we know he began to show himself to various people individually and collectively, including his disciples. In fact, you remember the story of Doubting Thomas, who said, I won't believe it unless I see the nail prints. And indeed, Jesus Christ appeared and showed him that very thing of his glorified body, and he cries out, my Lord and my God. He would say later to his disciples, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So we are no longer preaching the gospel of the kingdom, is at hand, for it's not. Though we still need to explain the biblical truths regarding the future earthly, political, messianic kingdom that is coming. Instead, we're preaching today the gospel of the grace of God, which according to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, is that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And the word gospel means good news, and this indeed is good news. That God in his grace is offering salvation to all. Because Christ died, which is the penalty for sin, for our sins. And he did it all according to the scriptures. He was buried, the proof that he died. And that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And this is part of that piece of the puzzle of Genesis 3.15. The good news that a lost sinner who deserves the penalty and punishment of their sins could be saved by the grace of God in light of the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again to provide salvation for us. So what did our Lord then command his disciples to do in light of his death for our sins and the sins of the world in his resurrection from the grave. While we're in Matthew 28, look at verse 18. That Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. By the way, if this wasn't for the entire church age, why would he be with us to the end of the age? It would make no sense. But keep in mind, the key phrase is, is to make disciples. How? By going and preaching the gospel. So that through hearing the gospel, they could be saved. What gospel would they preach? His death for our sins and his resurrection from the grave. When people get saved, they then have the opportunity to get baptized, to give public identification to that. And they also need to be taught more and more of the word of God. And by the way, the things I have commanded you, that phrase is, according to Lewis Berry Chafer, is reserved for the upper room discourse and the truths that then would follow from there. So we go now to Acts chapter 1. As we continue chronologically here. We see our resurrected Lord who is about to ascend into heaven. And he meets with his disciples. And we read in verse 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he had made in John 13, 14, 15, 16, which he said, 
you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with or by means of the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now keep in mind that the baptizing work of the Holy Spirit is the very means by which individuals get placed into the body of Christ. Verse 6, therefore when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus doesn't say, oh, by the way, we're not going to set up that kingdom. In fact, the promises made to the Israel in the Old Testament are not going to be spiritually fulfilled in the church. No, no, it doesn't say anything like that. Doesn't deny the reality of this. And by the way, he had said it was going to be delayed. They thought it would be delayed by a few days. Little did they know it would be 2,000 years. And we would have never guessed it either. And so what does he say? The kingdom that is being asked about is that promised and predicted messianic kingdom. Delayed but not denied. Promises postponed but not canceled. And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, God will determine the timing of this. That's not your concern. So, well, what is my concern? Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. In other words, that needs to be your focus. Don't you be concerned about when Christ sets up his kingdom. You be concerned about being a witness to the world, an ambassador for Jesus Christ, and getting out the message of the gospel. And you know, as I think of that, I can't help but think of believers at times who major in the minors instead of major in the majors, who say, are, are ignorant of the fact or, that Satan wants to divide and conquer and misfocus believers so that we're not striving together for the faith of the gospel. And so our Lord seeks to clarify their perspective. Verse 9, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as they went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so, again, the promise of his return. But in the meantime, what is God doing? Well, we know on Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came just as promised. Forty days later, he sends the Holy Spirit to the 120 in the upper room, as it were. We know that on that day, the church was birthed. For by one Spirit, we are all baptized now into one body. And what Christ is doing today is, again, he is building his church during this dispensation of grace. He's not setting up his kingdom. That will be yet future. He's building his church. So go with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Remember, who makes up his church, according to Ephesians chapter 2? It's Jews and Gentiles who, through faith in Christ as presented in the gospel, become one in the body of Christ. So we read in Ephesians 3 these words. Verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation, notice that word, of the grace of God, notice that phrase, which was given to me for you, as Paul was a major dispenser of these truths. How that by revelation, every dispensation begins with new revelation, he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known, it was concealed to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Now please note, 
with every new dispensation again, you've got new revelation mentioned here. You've got some truths that weren't revealed that are now revealed. You notice a dispensation is different than an age, but they're connected. Notice it hasn't been revealed in the Old Testament. It's now revealed in the New Testament. Who is it revealed to his holy apostles and prophets, not just to Paul. Don't buy that hyper-dispensational line that says only Paul's epistles are to us. He was the only apostle to the church. Only his... No, 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 no. No, holy apostles and prophets. And what was the mystery? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, the church, the body of Christ, and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. And so what Christ is doing today is he's building his church to the glory of God. And this universal church finds expression in local churches where believers Gather where Christ is preached, where the word of God is taught. And keep in mind, since this was a mystery, in the Old Testament, yes, they could see many things. Let's get this right here. Yes, they saw the birth of Christ. They could even see Calvary. They could see the Antichrist. They could see his second coming. They could see about the kingdom. They could see the, even some things about the new heaven and new what they could not see was the valley of the church because that was a mystery that has now been revealed. And we know that that church one day will be complete. One day that church will be resurrected as we look over here and raptured as we look over here and removed from the earth to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And this is our blessed hope, Titus 2.13. This is our purifying hope, 1 John 3.3. 3. This is our comforting hope, 1 Thessalonians 4.18. This is when Christ will fulfill his promise. As he went to prepare a place for us, and I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And as we think of the dispensation of the church, or of the grace of God in the church age, Faith in Jesus Christ is the condition for salvation. God also wants to have us have keep doctrine pure and guard the truth. The reality, however, is there's much impure doctrine and apostasy and false doctrine will permeate the church as it is today. And that is why I am convinced that the Lord Jesus Christ not only could come back at any time, but I am convinced it, it could be today. The stage is being set. We know that after he returns and catches away his bride will be the judgment seat of Christ in which church age believers will give an account of how they lived their life after they were saved. Not in order to go to heaven, it's only for believers, but whether or not they will be rewarded or not with a crown or with glory and praise and honor and so forth. And once all of that occurs, we know on earth there will be the tribulation to come. And it all begins according to Daniel chapter 9 with the signing of the peace treaty. And who again becomes the focus of God's plan and what will occur once the church is complete and resurrected or raptured? Israel will become the focus. And that is why as you look at even the usage of the word Israel in church in the book of Revelation, you see during that period in which the great tribulation is recorded, the church is missing. Why? Because it has been raptured when the tribulation is going on on earth. So go with me now to Revelation chapter 5. And in Revelation chapter 5, after the church has been resurrected, has been raptured, has it been rewarded, and is represented by the 24 elders. We read, And I, John, saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. This, dear friends, is the title deed of the earth. As remember, Genesis 3.15, there was going to be the reclaiming of this planet for God. <clears throat> And as a result, we recognize that 
That's exactly what our Lord is going to do here. As he's the one who comes forth, he's the line of the tribe of Judah. He is the lamb whose blood was slain from the foundation of the world and slain to redeem us. And he takes the title deed of the earth and he begins to unravel it. And as he does, he breaks the seals. And as he breaks the seal, the first thing you see is the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And in doing so, he reclaims the planet through war and famine and death and so forth. And we recognize that the wrath of God is being put out on the earth while the times of the tribulation are horrible times. In fact, by the time the first half of the tribulation is over, one-fourth of the planet is dead. After the seal judgments, there are the trumpet judgments, when again, God pours out his wrath on the earth. This, I believe, happens at the beginning of the second half of the tribulation. And by the time these are done, another one-third of the earth is dead. And how do people react to these judgments according to Revelation chapter 9? But the rest of the mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. In other words, they didn't turn yet to Jesus Christ. They still hung on, as it were, to their religion. But that is not to say people don't get saved in the tribulation. In fact, in light of the two witnesses of Revelation 11, we know that at least 144,000 Jews and a multitude of Gentiles are saved, I believe, in the first half of the tribulation. And we know that these tribulation witnesses under the sovereignty of God are then allowed to be killed by the Antichrist, but then on the third day gets resurrected as it were and raptured to heaven and beginning in Revelation chapter 12, we know that Satan is finally totally thrown out of heaven, not to have access again. That he is the serpent who now seeks to destroy Israel, and they go to some place in the wilderness, very likely the city of Petra. There is a war in heaven between Michael and the archangel and his angels and Satan and his angels. And again, Satan is cast down to the earth with a tremendous hatred of Israel. Why? Because in order for God to fulfill his promises, either Jesus Christ would have to fail or Israel could no longer exist. And since Christ would not fail, he seeks to exterminate every Jew on the planet so God could not fulfill his promises. And you see, Satan doesn't know who the Antichrist is going to be, which one God will allow fondly to rule. And he is very anti-Semitic, as expressed through Adolf Hitler and the tremendous killing of the Jews and even anti-Semitism in so many places today. And that's why in Revelation 13 we read about the Antichrist who fulfills the trinity of evil with the false prophet and the devil himself. And through that, those means, by the midpoint of the tribulation, they deceive the whole world. And the Antichrist demands universal worship as he now consolidates his power, as it were. And you are not allowed to eat or drink or buy or sell, as it were, without taking the mark of the beast, which doesn't seem far out in our day at all. Because all it requires is a computer chip implant, as it were. We know in the last part of the great tribulation that the bold judgments occur as God is again pouring out his wrath upon this deserving planet. And eventually Babylon is destroyed People are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And go with me now to Revelation chapter 19. Where we read about the second coming of Jesus Christ, not to the earth for his church, but to the earth with his church. Verse 11, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, not the blood of Calvary, but the blood of people he's going to destroy. And his name is called the Word of God, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fight linen, white and clean, the church, followed him on white horses. 
Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations, just like Psalm 2 said. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. And he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And on his robe and on his thigh, name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together. Why? For the supper of the great God. That you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse against his army. And by the way, this is the battle of Armageddon, which is really technically in eight stages, but will culminate in that battle in the valley of Megiddo. That's why it's called Armageddon. And what do we read in verse 20? Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive where? And the lake of fire burning with brimstone, the ultimate place of punishment. Verse 21, and the rest were killed, and the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the flesh were filled with, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And we know that it'll be a tremendous slaughter. It won't even be a war, as it were. It won't even really be a battle. It'll be an absolute slaughter upon this unbelieving, Christ-rejecting world in which Jesus Christ then, by the time this happens, three-quarters of the then-known world is destroyed and dead. Christ comes back as a word of the Mount of Olives, just like he promised. Visibly, physically, glorified body, his feet will plant themselves on the Mount of Olives, just like Acts 1 said. And he will then begin to set up his kingdom. And like with any kingdom, there will be a transitional time in which he sets up his government. We know about the 75-day interval and transition at the end of Daniel chapter 12. And what follows the second coming of Christ to the earth is he's going to set up his eternal kingdom with the millennial stage in which he will reign on this planet. Again, we've referred to this as the millennium. But keep in mind, this is simply the first stage of God's eternal kingdom, according to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, as his kingdom shall never be destroyed. It'll be ful the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. As Satan's world system will one day be replaced by the kingdom of God's dear son. So we go to chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil, and Satan and bound him. For a thousand years, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and set him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these, he must be released for a little while. So we see here that Satan, as it were, is cast into that bottomless pit. That isn't today, that's in the future. And you see, all those promises that were made in the Old Testament about Israel and the Messiah ruling on the throne of David have never been fulfilled, but in that day, they will. As again, God's covenants will finally be fulfilled, as it were, in the kingdom to come. And notice the first stage is a thousand years. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus. Well, to see them, they had to be resurrected. And for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. These are tribulation saints. 
And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death, which we'll see in a moment, has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. Now watch this. And shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired. You know, it's incredible. Six times in six verses. It mentions a thousand years, and there are those today who say a thousand years doesn't mean a thousand years. And they make it mean a long time. Because they don't believe in a literal kingdom on earth in fulfillment of Old Testament promises. But that's exactly what we have here. We have Jesus Christ sitting on the throne of David and ruling from Jerusalem in that kingdom to come. We see that Israel finally enjoying the land, realizing the church reigning with Christ. Israel, the head of the Gentiles and the Gentile nations, in blessing. According to Ezekiel, there will be a millennial temple and the, the uh, dimensions of it are absolutely recorded there in the future. And we know that all people will know the Lord. We know that... Population growth will be amazing. We recognize the curse will largely be reversed and certain jobs will no longer be needed. In fact, they'll turn the weapons of war into plowshares. And justice will finally occur on the earth with even tremendous topographical changes. But what happens after the thousand years is ended and what are the results? Verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. And will go out to deceive the nations which are on the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose numbers of the sand of the sea, not the same Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 37 through 39, which happened in the first half of the tribulation. This is a different battle. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. You say, where did these rebels come from? While there were tribulation saints who entered into the kingdom with unredeemed bodies, with the full capacity to be able to reproduce which they did. They had children that were born sinners who needed to be saved. And though Jesus Christ was ruling and reigning there on the planet, they refused to put their faith in him alone. Showing once again, even in ideal circumstances, man is a spiritual flop and a failure in self-rule and self-dependence apart from the grace of God. And as a result, we recognize that what happens now to Satan, chapter 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beasts and the false prophets are, and by the way, so were his demons, and they will be tormented Day and night, forever and ever. Yes, one day justice will be rendered and Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. But unfortunately, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15 tells us that there is coming a day in which also anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire as well. Why? Because they have their day in court and instead of putting their faith in Jesus Christ, they trusted their works instead. And as a result, that rejection of Christ cost, cost them eternity with the Lord. And they are put into the lake of fire, the final destination of all who reject Jesus Christ. But that's not the end of the story, chapter 21, verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. And so we see here, there's going to be a new heavens and there's going to be a new earth one day. And there's going to be a new Jerusalem, verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrows, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. What an amazing sight to see that new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And seeing now, as it were, a new heavens and a new earth. 
And so we see the eternal state in contrast to the lake of fire. Those who enjoy the eternal state are those who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. For they weren't any more worthy to go there than those who ended up in the lake of fire. The difference was what they thought and believed about Jesus Christ. So how does the Bible and God's plan of the ages end? It ends with a total reversal of what had happened or began in the garden, then due to the fall, and now God creating a new heaven and new earth. They call it the Alpha and Omega Principle. We read in Genesis, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. We read in Revelation, there shall be no more death nor sorrow. We read in Genesis, Satan appears as a deceiver of man. And we read in Revelation, Satan disappears forever. We see in Genesis, they're shown a garden into which defilement entered. In Revelation, they're shown a city into which nothing enters, which defiles. In fact, go to Revelation 22. Verse 5, there shall be no night there. They, they need no lamp nor the light of sun. For the Lord God himself, the Lord gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. You see, as you compare Genesis and Revelation, you will see a total reversal of the curse. And God fulfilling that promise of Genesis 3.15. Of not only providing a savior for man, but redeeming the planet for God. Through another man, the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ will be the center, and he will be the glory of God's universe. And so the story ends with the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. So what is the lesson of history or his story? That the purpose of God in his plan of the ages is to glorify his sovereignty and grace in creation and redemption, ultimately expressed in the establishment of his kingdom in the heavens and the earth through Jesus Christ. Again, dear friends, it's all about the glory of God. For God being seen as God. And for God showing his grace and showing his faithfulness. And man being exposed as a spiritual flop and a failure in self-rule and self-dependence apart from the grace of God. Again, we saw at the beginning of our studies that God has a plan for the universe. God has a plan for the salvation of individual men. God has a plan for Israel. God has a plan for the church. God has a plan for the angels. He even has a plan for the demons. And at the end of this story, it'll all bring glory to God. How does this apply to you as a believer in Christ? Let me ask you. Are you thinking like Paul did, whether I eat or drink or whatever we do, do all to the glory of God? In light of the great salvation we have and wonderful position in Christ, can we say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain? Do we let the love of Christ compel us to live for him who died for us? So we learn to do whatever we do heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men and realize that it's required of a steward that a man be found faithful. But admitting we're not faithful in ourselves. So we yield to the Lord and we rely upon him instead of self-rule and self-dependence. And we do so in light of the fact that we are new creations in Christ. Co-crucified, co-buried, co-risen, co-ascended, co-seated in the heavenlies of Christ. You know, as we're on the verge of a new year, may it be our heart's desire to want to glorify the Lord in all that we say and all that we do and all that we think. But in doing so, admit we are totally incapable of that. And that's why we must walk by faith and fellowship with him. And abide in him that he can produce this fruit in our life. But if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, we end in Revelation 22, verse 16 and 17. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the bride, the church, say, come, 
and let him who hears, are you listening? Say, come, and let him who thirsts, the unsaved, come, and whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. And why is it freely? Because Jesus paid it all. And it's a gift. And you must come by faith to Christ and rely upon him and him alone for your salvation. And you need to come and you need to come today. You need to not wait any longer. In fact, chapter 22, verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen, every believer says in essence, even so come, Lord Jesus. Someone has said, if you've only been born once, you'll die twice. If you've been born twice, you're only going to die once. In fact, you may not even die once if the Lord Jesus comes again. And he is coming again. And it could be today. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I know I covered a lot today, but through this series, may we really have grasped from beginning to end your plan of the ages. And we know it's not, first of all, about us. It's not even, first of all, about our salvation. It's about your glory and the glory of your Son and how you magnify your grace and you magnify your faithfulness by saving sinners and fulfilling your promises not only to us in salvation and not only to us in the Christian life, but one day the promises you have made about setting up your kingdom on earth through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that in the meantime, the Lord Jesus is building his church and we have the privilege of being part of that and being identified with him. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're coming again. We know it could be today. And we look forward to that. May we live in light of that. Live in light of this blessed hope, this purifying hope, this comforting hope. And may our lives bring honor and glory to you. As you are worthy of it all. And Father, if there's anyone here today who's never been saved, may they realize it's not a matter of praying a prayer or asking Jesus into their heart or coming forward or promising or pledging anything. But in the quietness of the heart where they're seated, may they be willing to put their faith, their trust, their confidence in Jesus Christ alone to save them, believing that he died for their sins and rose again to accomplish that very reality in their life. That they may walk out of this auditorium a new creation in Christ with a total change of destiny from a hell they deserve to a heaven they don't a new identity, a new position, and with the new possessions and new privileges as a child of God. Thank you so much for all that you have provided by your grace. We give you the glory in Jesus' name.